Thank you for standing by and welcome to the Paradigm Biopharmaceuticals Investor Webinar today. All participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be an initial slide presentation lasting approximately 40 minutes before we allow some time to get through as much Q&A as possible. If you'd like to submit a live question, please do so using the Q&A panel within Zoom. Appearing on behalf of Paradigm today, we have Chairman Paul Rennie, CEO Marco Polizzi, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Donna Skerritt, and Director of, Director of Investor Relations, Simon White. To begin, I'll hand it over to Simon. Please go ahead. Thanks, Matt, uh, and a big welcome. And thank you to everyone who has dialed in for today's investor update. Today's webinar uh, is an opportunity for Paradigm uh, to introduce our new CEO, Marco Polizzi, who officially joined the company on the 1st of July. Marco will provide some detail on his background uh, in the industry and what excites him uh, with the opportunity um, in front of us at Paradigm. We will then hear from Dr. Donna Skerritt on the progress that has been made in PAR's clinical development programs. Dr. Skerritt will focus primarily on some key slides uh, in the investor presentation that is available to all Paradigm shareholders uh, on our website. At the conclusion of Dr. Skerritt's presentation, uh, we will cover as many investor questions as possible within the hour time period. With that, I will hand over to Marco Politi, CEO of Paradigm. Thank you, Simon, and um, appreciate everybody's uh, interest and participation in this um, webinar. And um, appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself. As Simon had mentioned, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my background and kind of what drew me to the opportunity here at Paradigm. So um, I've been in the industry for a little over 30 years, um, all within the pharmaceutical industry and all within the U.S. I've been in various sectors of the pharmaceutical industry, including active pharmaceutical ingredient businesses, generic pharmaceutical businesses, and innovative branded pharmaceutical businesses. I've also spent time both on the retail side and on the hospital side of the business, which include injectable products, of course. Um, I spent a few years um, within the uh, areas of pharmaceutical benefit manager at Medco, one of the world's largest um, prescription benefit managers, which really drove reimbursement of pharmaceutical drugs in the US, and a couple of years at a drug wholesaler, one of the top three that dominate the space in the US. So those two experiences really gave me um, a lot of um, peripheral um, understanding of the commercialization of drugs in the US. I also had the distinct opportunity to start up new divisions um, of existing companies five times throughout my career. Um, most of those have been driven through business development activities, whereby I would go out and identify, negotiate, and execute agreements that would bring those products or assets to the organization that would create the existence of these new divisions. Consequently, um, I've done, I'm sure, over 50 deals throughout my career. Um, and um, in many cases, those deals have led to, in some cases, um, exits. So my most recent uh, startup, which I started about four years ago, we ran through a process through an investment banking firm, recognizing that that opportunity or that business would um, eventually be sold, I decided to approach the recruiters, which led me to Paradigm. Um, I met Paul through Corn Ferry, a, a global recruiter, and um, became very excited about Paradigm because of really the following reasons. Uh, first off, you know, recognizing that Paradigm has a late stage asset in phase three for osteoarthritis, um, a non-opioid um, product to treat pain and function of the knee. And that's a very large market. And it's a very attractive way to dealing with pain given the alternative options that currently exist, which are not um, as, as appealing in my mind as what we, we have here at Paradigm. Um, as I learned more about the company and found that the molecule had been in existence in the US uh, through Almiron, a $300 million brand that was marketed by J&J &J and had been off patent for many years, you know, I recognize that this molecule is well tolerated, obviously, since it's been used so many years and it's demonstrated efficacy as Elmeron is um, indicated for pain in the bladder. So it really intrigued me even more. Um, but knowing that the product, the molecule was off patent, I really wanted to understand um, what type of protection paradigm had around um, this molecule. 
So um, I obviously coming from the active pharmaceutical and generic pharmaceutical industry, it was um, our business to replicate uh, molecules and branded products to be genericized. And I had very good connections there and reached out to a couple of the largest in the world of developing active pharmaceutical ingredients and um, generic pharmaceuticals. And in each of the cases, I was told by these individuals that had worked at these companies for many years that they had initiated projects on this molecule. And after years of attempting to replicate it, they had given up, rest, stating that the product was just far too complex. And one had suggested that it was biosimilar like in nature, which was a term that was used during the interview process and was really intriguing to me because um, that really gives you confidence of you know, the protection around the molecule. Um, Paul had told me about the 25 years exclusivity that we have from the point of commercializing the product with Bene Pharma on the API and how the product was very complex and difficult to replicate. But I still wanted to do more due diligence and um, so I did, I looked into the patent protection and recognizing that we had several patents um, already granted and more to be filed um, that further strengthened my conviction of the opportunity. Um, in speaking with uh, Paul and others about the funding, recognizing that the company had been very well funded up to this point, and yet they haven't even touched the uh, US market for further funding. Um, as they've kind of kept most of the focus of the development activities and of the investment within Australia, um, became even more excited because I feel there's a lot of opportunity um, as this company becomes more um, uh, known in the U.S. market. And then finally, you know, it, it, the, the, the company has not approached the um, partnering opportunities, and um, it's it's been a strategy, I believe, up to this point to continue to progress the product. And given how good the data has been to this point, um, we've maintained a great deal of confidence in uh, the successful outcome in the future of the phase three. And as a result, have wanted to keep the asset um, progressing before um, entering into transactions going forward. And I think that's an area where I could really bring a lot of uh, value and um, contribute to Paradigm with my experience and contacts in the US with partnering opportunities. So I'm excited to join um, the company and uh, believe that I've made a very good decision. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to, um, to Simon. Thanks, Marco. Uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Skerritt. Uh, and as mentioned, we will just focus on some key slides from this presentation uh, on the phase three program um, of osteoarthritis and also touch on uh, the clinical development program in NPS. So Donna, please go ahead. Thank you, Simon. So I'd like to start with slide 10 of the presentation. Thank you all in advance for attending uh, today's webinar. Slide 10 represents a culmination of about two and a half years of activity. In 2020, we presented to the uh, FDA for a pre-IND meeting. And at that time, we learned of the FDA's expectations for a registration program for xylosol for osteoarthritis. And that included our conducting new non-clinical studies under GLP conditions, as well as designing and executing on two uh, well-controlled studies. After much uh, interaction with the FDA uh, through the IND review process, we were cleared to proceed. Our first uh, patient was enrolled in Australia at the end of 2021. I'm happy to say today that we have over 50 active sites in the US, Canada, Australia, and the UK. We also have a number of sites going through the regulatory and ethics review process in Europe. Now, this uh, study is what we call a globally harmonized study, meaning that uh, the requirements of each of these jurisdictions have been 
negotiated and included in our uh, protocols. And that means at the time of our uh, regulatory submissions for approval, we will be presenting data sets to the regulators that they've agreed that if successful, we'll meet their requirements for registration. Importantly, we've also made the decision to uh, make this program global at the Para 002 stage. And that means once we finish enrolling this initial pivotal study, uh, when we begin the confirmatory study, all of the global sites will be in place. The global regulatory approvals will be in place. So we will be able to seamlessly roll over from the uh, pivotal study to the confirmatory study. Next slide, please. So here's what this looks like in terms of timing. We've initiated the pivotal study with the primary endpoint of improvement in pain and function compared to placebo control. And this study has two stages. At first, we will uh, undertake a dose selection process, and that will occur early in 2023. Once the dose selection is completed, the confirmatory study can begin, and that's the study on the red bar, 003. Both of these studies will end after six months. Um, the patient's primary endpoints occur at day 56, and then they are followed out to six months. The patients then have the opportunity to follow on in a extension study where we monitor their duration of effect um, to the therapy and also monitor uh, MRIs to understand what the uh, progress uh, is in terms of their joint uh, anatomy. The NDA submission will consist of the pivotal study and the confirmatory study and any additional data, particularly safety data from the extension studies. The NDA will be filed when the data from 002 and 003 are complete and um, uh, packaged up uh, in the regulatory submission. And that's uh, slated to occur in 2025. Now, with regards to the NDA submission and the program overall, this year, we were very happy to report that the FDA granted us fast track designation for the osteoarthritis program. This means that the FDA understands and agrees that osteoarthritis is a serious condition with an unmet medical need, and the Paradigms OA program has the potential to meet that unmet need. The program includes increased interaction with the FDA, uh, particularly with senior management, and also the opportunity at NDA filing to apply for priority review. Priority review then gives us a six month review period as opposed to 10 months. So it does shorten the review period, all in recognition of the designation uh, being in place so that the FDA can move forward or fast track programs that are promising for ongoing unmet needs. We also have some other clinical activity ongoing now. We've recently announced that we've completed enrollment in study 008. This is a study evaluating synovial fluid biomarkers, serum bark biomarkers, MRI, and clinical effects of PPS in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee. We were very eager to conduct and then complete enrollment of the study. Uh, the primary endpoint is day 56, and so top line data from this study will be available at the end of September of this year. And along with that, we have a canine study, which is evaluating uh, dogs with osteoarthritis who are receiving PPS. Uh, we also have a few controls in that study as well. And they're also having synovial fluid evaluations, clinical evaluations, and MRI studies being done. If we go to the next slide, I can share a little bit more information about these two biomarker studies. The real value in evaluating biomarkers now is to understand the disease modifying potential of xylosol for osteoarthritis. In our prior phase two study, we saw signals that uh, PPS had disease modifying effects on OA. We saw that the size of bone marrow edema lesions decreased in PPS treated patients compared to controls. We also saw that serum biomarkers of cartilage destruction decreased 
in PPS treated patients and increased in control subjects. These two taken together suggest that PPS has not only effects on the bone marrow lesions themselves, but also on uh, the process of cartilage destruction. And so in order to understand what's going on in the synovial fluid itself, we undertook the current study to evaluate that fluid, to look for the biomarkers there, and to put together a mechanistic uh, understanding of what's going on inside the joint, inside the serum, uh, inside um, the structure through MRI, as well as uh, correlating that with clinical outcomes. And that's the information that's needed to put together a disease modifying um, story uh, for extending the label to disease modification. As I mentioned, we have a companion canine study that's enrolling uh, now and will uh, have data available at the end of September as well. At day 56, we'll be looking at pain and function in the animals. We also will be evaluating MRIs, synovial fluid, and serum. And importantly, what we will learn from the canine study is that because the dogs uh, age uh, quicker than humans, the 20-week follow-up period in a dog will equate to about three years of human follow-up, including the structural uh, changes in the knee. So we will get a very nice picture of what's going on in the knee over the equivalent of a three-year time span from this study. The uh, value of a disease-modifying program is that from the clinical perspective, physicians will be very eager to have a treatment available that can alter the course of disease. Currently, uh, treatments for osteoarthritis target pain, and 80% uh, of patients uh, are, are not happy with the uh, responses they have to either oral non-steroidos, paracetamol, uh, or knee injections, which are limited. And um, ultimately, some patients are then treated with opioids, which is uh, uh, fraught with uh, unacceptable risk. And so the availability of a drug that can uh, impact and improve pain and function, as well as have a favorable impact by decreasing progression of disease, will be uh, well received by the medical community. We also know from the payer perspective that the uh, reimbursement value of a pain and function drug will be about $2,500 a year, whereas one with disease modifying um, uh, activity on the label will have a reimbursement targeted around $6,500 a year for, from a commercial perspective that is also much uh, increased in value for the company. I also uh, want to bring to your attention that uh, this year, uh, there'll be some activity with the para 2 pivotal study. As we meet milestones from that study, we will share those. Uh, importantly, we have the dose selection uh, coming up early in 2023. And prior to that, we expect to announce the first formal DSMB review of the study where they've looked at uh, both safety and efficacy data and uh, given us from their review uh, the comments, uh, hopefully to proceed without changes. So we're very excited about the upcoming milestones in the OA study, as well as the para 8 study and the K9 study. Next slide, please. I'd like to say a few words about the mucopolysaccharidosis program. This is a, a disease of uh, inborn error of metabolism where patients are unable to break down um, uh, uh, gag proteins and as a result uh, have uh, a lot of morbidity and mortality uh, very early in life. And the two available treatments to patients, uh, MPS1 is uh, bone marrow transplant, which needs to be conducted early in life. And for patients with MPS type 6, we have available enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, and both of these treatments improve the outcome of patients and, and importantly, improve their uh, cognitive development as well as uh, improving their lifespan. However, patients still have ongoing problems with um, uh, their musculoskeletal system. They have inflammation in the joints from the gags, and that leads to uh, an arthropathy that is both painful and uh, limits their function. And so early research um, from uh, some of our colleagues uh, at um, 
uh, Mount Sinai School of Med Medicine uh, identified that uh, PPS had the potential to uh, improve the uh, joint dysfunction in PPS. And so we've undertaken um, the approach to uh, MPS that uh, as an orphan indication, we would like to pursue development uh, here because the unmet need is quite significant. We are conducting a clinical trial uh, in Australia on MPS-1 subjects. We have fully enrolled that study. And um, PPS has been well tolerated when the study patients have uh, completed all their treatment and follow-up, we'll be giving an update on that um, program. We're also conducting a um, placebo-controlled trial with MPS type 6. These are patients who are receiving enzyme replacement therapy. And because the enzyme replacement therapy does not penetrate the joint space, they too have ongoing problems with uh, joint pain and function. So we're evaluating those patients for tolerance as well as clinical effect. We have introduced that study at a large uh, meeting, the World Symposium in February of 22. Um, the, there's a lot of interest in this indication from both the clinical and the business perspective. We are about 50% enrolled uh, with the potential for the remaining patients to be identified uh, shortly. Um, we have achieved FDA and EMA recognition, recognition um, uh, as an orphan designation for MPS. And we are developing a good understanding of what the composite endpoints for a registration study would look like in this indication. Uh, as with osteoarthritis, we've had uh, discussions with regulators to understand the regulatory pathway. And because the program is an orphan indication and the uh, patient populations are very small. Um, we're gathering data now to have the appropriate composite endpoint for a registration study. So with that, I think I'll go to the next slide on just uh, what to expect uh, coming up in terms of news flow. So I've mentioned uh, both of the MPS programs, so we'll be updating you as we meet uh, uh, milestones in those two programs. We'll provide ongoing updates uh, as to the activity in the PARA-002 uh, trial uh, later this year, the DMC review early in 2023, the dose selection. And following dose selection, we will then uh, begin the confirmatory study. We also have the extension study that we've mentioned, which will take the patients from six months out to a total of two years of follow-up. And so the first patients are due to be enrolled in the extension study later this summer. Uh, we've mentioned earlier that we received our fiscal year 21 tax rebate, and we expect to receive the fiscal year 22 tax rebate uh, in coming months as well. Uh, we are undergoing uh, ongoing activity to further uh, increase our IP portfolio and protection across our programs. And also in the very near term, we will share with you our learnings from the canine uh, OA model, as well as from the human clinical study and um, uh, biomarkers uh, evaluating synovial fluid along with serum clinical effects and uh, MRI findings. As we accrue additional data from uh, both the canine study and the 008 study, meaning six month data, and then eventually one year study, we will of course uh, share those updates with the market as well. Thank you very much for your time and attention and I'll hand back to Simon for the next phase. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Marco. Um, we might just head into some questions. Uh, so thank you to all that have submitted some questions uh, for the team. Uh, Paul, we might start with you. So just to ensure you, we all come off mute. Um, question from an investor, on current cash burn, how many quarters of funding uh, does Paradigm have? And how does the board plan to address any issue of funding for the remainder of the clinical development program? Well, uh, thanks, Simon, and also thanks to the shareholder who asked the question. Obviously, critical question. Uh, and just to um, remind everybody that uh, next week, uh, Paradigm will be uh, disclosing its um, quarterly report, and we will show, so to answer the question, um, approximately 4.5 quarters of cash. So at the moment, um, 
uh, we will report that we'll have around about between 39 and 40 million Australian dollars in the bank. Uh, we have a, um, a, a cash burn of around about 8 million Australian dollars per quarter, but that is um, also very uh, variable at this point in time because we have made sure that uh, we pay our CRO who's um, helping Paradigm conduct our clinical study in terms of uh, the, the site initiation, the training, and uh, first patient recruited, et cetera. We have linked those activities to milestones. So when I say it's um, uh, a little bit variable, for example, we have um, potentially two US $3 million um, milestone payments some stage in, in the near future, which um, at the moment it's uh, forecast to be probably in quarter one calendar year 2023, but that may also uh, be brought forward uh, if we are fortunate to have some progress and those payments may fall in Q4 of calendar year 2022. So it is a little bit variable, but I, I think um, to answer the question, um, approximately um, uh, 30 to 39 to 40 million dollars cash in the bank. Um, we have around about um, uh, 4.5 uh, quarters of cash uh, with our current spend and forecast. Um, and to answer the um, the second part of the question, um, how does the board um, intend to uh, address the issue of, of uh, capital going forward? Uh, I think we, we've said, um, uh, first of all, that if there was uh, any capital raising event, we would always include um, our, our long-term and supportive shareholders by way of a SPP or a rights issue. Um, so we've made that comment at the last AGM and we continue to maintain that um, commitment to our shareholders. But in terms of um, uh, capital raising, we are also looking at trying to um, do some strategic partnerships. And when I say strategic, I mean maybe partnering with, and this is our plan, it's no um, guarantee, it's not um, to be taken as a, um, a, a forecast, but we are looking to, um, now that Marco's on board especially, to ramp up um, some of the discussions that we've had with companies who have an interest in the um, NPS asset. So just to remind everyone, the uh, NPS uh, was discovered um, by researchers at the ICANN School of Medicine in Mount Sinai in New York. PPS was shown um, in the initial animal models that um, PPS could attenuate some of the um, uh, morbidities that Dr. Skerritt mentioned. And um, that was then followed up with a phase two study that was conducted in uh, Germany. And so that was a um, four patient study, open label study, and showed very good um, uh, responses to the drug in, in patients who were on enzyme replacement therapy and also receiving um, pendazan as a combined therapy. We saw a re reduction in their pain levels. We saw improvement in range of motion for their, their, um, their joints. We also saw some objective data, which was the reduction in the, um, the GAG proteins that Dr. Skerritt mentioned. Um, so we saw these um, GAG proteins uh, returning to the upper level of normal, which is really quite an, an amazing outcome. So we're looking to um, hopefully monetize that asset and um, uh, do a deal with uh, a company in the rare disease space. But just to um, uh, let investors know that it's, it's not um, uh, necessarily something that is, um, is about to start. We have been working with rare disease companies for some time. And um, one of the uh, issues that came up in our discussions was uh, with the rare disease experts, they've said, okay, well, your phase two study in Germany showed that you can uh, attenuate these uh, morbidities in patients who are on, on enzyme replacement therapy. And enzyme replacement therapy is one of the two ways of treating MPS. As Dr. Skerritt said, the other um, method of treatment is a bone marrow transplant. So the uh, experts in the rare disease space said, does your drug work on patients who have been treated with a bone marrow transplant? So that gave rise to the study that was, um, is, is still um, being conducted at the Women's and Children's Hospital in Adelaide, which is an international uh, uh, specialist site for MPS. 
and the four patients that are being treated there, and, and it is an open label study, so we do have some um, data and we have disclosed that, have had very good outcomes, but all of those subjects uh, were treated with um, bone marrow transplant. So now combining that with our previous data, we can now go to these rare disease companies and say, look, we now know that um, in the studies, we, if whether the patient's on enzyme replacement therapy or they've had a bone marrow transplant, uh, we know that our drug PPS can actually uh, add to the efficacy of those previous treatments and it could be a very useful add-on therapy. So I'm really uh, delighted and excited that we have that data and uh, also very delighted and excited that Marco will be working uh, with those rare disease companies and see if we can um, monetize that asset uh, as a, a form of non-dilutive funding for the company. Um, but uh, obviously um, we have to wait and see what that deal will bring as to whether or not that will um, satisfy all of our um, capital requirements going forward or whether we need to um, source some funding uh, from the market. But uh, we'll obviously keep investors updated as we go. But I think um, shareholders should understand that um, if there is any um, capital raise that they, they will be uh, catered for in the uh, capital raise by way of a, a share purchase plan or a rights issue. So hopefully that answers the question, Simon. Um, yep, thank you, Paul. Donna, we might um, direct this question to you. Assuming the results from Para 008 are positive, can you please describe the regulatory discussions uh, that will follow uh, with the various regulatory agencies, particularly the FDA for potential surrogate endpoints for the phase three for accelerated approval and the TGA for provisional approval. Certainly, thank you, Simon. So I mentioned that the uh, Para 08 will be sharing with you the top line data at the end of September. We then have uh, data at six months in those patients and uh, the study completes at a one year. As we look at those data, we'll be putting together the disease modifying um, picture from PPS based on what we know from the literature from our prior study and what we're learning from this study. In terms of the discussions with the regulators, uh, it's important for us to have a good understanding of how PPS impacts the joint on a longer term basis. Uh, ultimately, the regulators want to understand uh, from uh, the perspective of the, the joint space what is occurring with PPS over time and what to expect over a longer term um, picture. To say exactly uh, when we'll go to the TGA and to regulators really depends on what our understanding is of uh, the data at um, 56 days as compared to six months. Uh, ultimately, what we will put together is a um, harmonized protocol for disease modifying endpoints similar to what we've done for OA. The goal of that being to provide the regulatory authorities with the information they will need in order to extend the label should the data suggest that. And um, that may be through acquiring uh, new data or through acquiring new pre-specified analyses with existing data. So uh, to answer the question, we will have those discussions with the regulators on what the disease modifying endpoints uh, should, um, should be given the data that we have and uh, specifically on what the analyses should look like and how we acquire those data, whether from existing secondary endpoints in the currently, stu currently ongoing studies or whether new studies need to be conducted. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Marco, we might shift across to you. Uh, a question here. What do you feel are the biggest hurdles for biopharma companies in Paradigm's position from this point onwards? Thank you, Simon, for the question. Um, I would say managing the risk reward of licensing out your assets. Um, you have to balance the desire of some stakeholders to secure commercial partnerships and maximizing the value of your asset, which is a balancing act. Uh, we don't just want to partner and license. 
for the sake of doing so, we want to assure that we secure the best possible partnership with the best possible terms and the most value for shareholders. And we recognize we have several assets given the multiple indications that we are and that we intend to pursue and the fact that these are global assets. So we could be very selective in terms of partnering by country or by region, by indication. And that's an area that I intend to be um, very focused on and a key objective of mine over the next 12 months, as I believe Paula had, had suggested. Um, but I, I think that's uh, maybe not the biggest hurdle, but a major consideration and a key initiative um, and a decision that has to be taken um, very carefully. Thanks, Marco. We might just stay with you for the next question. Um, is, are there any remnant away and or NPS conferences that Paradigm will be represented or presenting at um, in the near future? Yes, there is. Paradigm has established a publication planning committee um, to identify the key conferences for presentations. And these presentations and submissions of abstracts are planned around key data availability from various indications in uh, Paradigm's development pipeline. And that'll be a driver for the decision of which conferences we intend to um, be at. The company is assessing many conferences, including EU LAR and OARSI for osteoarthritis, and uh, the International Conference on Lysosomal Disease and World Symposium for MPS in 2023. And, uh, We'll certainly keep shareholders abreast and informed on the presentations made at each of those conferences. Thank you. Um, Donna, back to you. Studies are notoriously difficult in managing the placebo response. What has Paradigm learned from its previous phase two study and what has been implemented into the phase three program to minimize any placebo response. Thank you, Simon. So as you mentioned, um, in pain studies, the placebo response is uh, always a concern. And it derives from expectation that the drug uh, has a clinical effect and therefore patients on placebo perceive that they're getting better and report that. Now, in order to manage that, we have uh, retained a specialty uh, uh, research organization that just works on placebo response. And they do this by training the staff and by uh, training the patients. Uh, staff training is very important because the way in which uh, the research staff ask a patient a question about their progress can lead them to either be balanced or lead them to provide a response that they think the doctor or nurse is expecting out of them. So we have ongoing training uh, on, uh, on, on placebo responses. The other aspect of this is that um, the company also needs to be rather conservative and balanced during the uh, recruitment and treatment period of our pivotal studies so that we're not creating too many uh, expectations that um, may uh, carry down to the sites and, and to the patients on study. Certainly the data from the experts in placebo uh, uh, effect management uh, show that using these methods to uh, train and retrain staff and uh, teach them the appropriate language when approaching their patients, and also the uh, instructions to the patients as they fill out their uh, pain responses, and these are all done on devices, uh, have been very effective in controlling the placebo response. So we are uh, taking uh, every uh, precaution uh, that is, is available to assure that the placebo response is, is well controlled in our studies. Thanks, Donna. Um, Paul, this might be a question for you. Will there be an opportunity to hear directly from Benet Pharmachem at some point in the future? Given such a close working relationship uh, with them and Paradigm, it would be nice to hear some background, history, and their vision for the future alongside Paradigm. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, thank you, Simon. And thanks to the investor for that um, 
excellent question. Um, yes, we, we um, have plans at some stage uh, during calendar year 2023 to invite um, the senior uh, management and, and board from uh, Benno Farmer to Australia and uh, participate in a, in a similar sort of roadshow that we've been conducting over the last two weeks where they can meet and greet uh, many of the, uh, the Paradigm shareholders and uh, answer those uh, questions that are posed by shareholders in particular, um, their thoughts in relation to the Benno Paradigm uh, agreement, um, how they, they view uh, Paradigm as a, a very valuable partner, what the future holds for both companies and um, any other developments that might um, uh, be worthwhile uh, discussing with shareholders at that particular point in time. So I, I hope sometime in calendar year 2023, uh, we'll be able to um, have the, the Ben A folks um, attend Australia. They're, they're probably um, at the moment looking for reasons to travel outside of Germany, given the heat wave that's going through. So they, they may uh, not be um, uh, too comfortable with the temperatures rising up towards uh, 30 plus degrees in Munich, which is probably for the first time in their history. So. Um, Yes, we'll, we'll hopefully have some news for shareholders 2023, Simon, and thanks again for the question. Thanks, Paul. Very exciting. Um, Donna, another question for you. Um, we've heard about the NFL Alumni Health Partnership. Mm -hmm. Can we just dive into that a little bit more? What does it look like? How did it come about? Um, if you could, please. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so we're very pleased to share the news of the research partnership that we have um, reached with the NFL alumni uh, group. Um, we previously conducted a, uh, a EAP treatment protocol on 10 former NFL players who were suffering with uh, painful osteoarthritis of the knee. And they had very good outcomes with the treatment and have been very uh, interested in learning more about Paradigm's program. And they've shared their experience with the alumni health group. And out of those communications, we uh, were approached to speak with this uh, uh, alumni health group about our company. And um, they offered us a, a research partnership agreement uh, what this agreement will do is provide information to the NFL alumni, uh, primarily through their uh, chapters, their 40 such chapters in the United States, and we'll inform them about what Paradigm is doing for osteoarthritis. Obviously, we'll uh, share with them the work we're doing in clinical trials. Uh, we've uh, heard from them that they may have many uh, alumni who would be uh, interested in participating in our clinical trials. So we are working with their team on uh, how the information around our clinical trials will be shared with them. Uh, in terms of the details, um, we are just getting started with our um, discussions with their uh, expert uh, team, which includes physicians with uh, expertise in, in clinical research as well. And so we will work out how we reach out to these alumni chapters, introduce them to Paradigm, introduce them to uh, our clinical trial. Uh, the alumni health group will assist with uh, some pre-screening activities and also assist the alumni uh, if they need uh, help with um, particular trial activities such as transportation, et cetera. So we're really looking forward to um, building up this research partnership, we think it's an important uh, uh, collaboration to have. And clearly, the NFL uh, players who, uh, NFL alumni who were previously treated, uh, felt strongly enough about their outcomes that they wanted to share this with their colleagues as well. So we consider it uh, an honor to be uh, recognized with them and to have the opportunity to work with them. Thanks, Donna. Um, it looks like we've we've sort of answered most of the question. There is there is one more here um, that I might just say to, to Paul or Donna. Um, given the the huge uh, opportunity in osteoarthritis, what threat to Paradigm's plan is presented by alternative OA treatments in development?
Donna, uh, would you like, would you like to, me to take that? Yeah, yes, why don't you have the yeah. first um, crack at answering that? I, I do have some ideas. Yes. So um, I'll start out by saying that um, we're very confident in the uh, PPS uh, effects to favorably impact osteoarthritis, not just in terms of improving pain and function, but also uh, the potential disease modifying effects. And that is because we've previously conducted a phase two study. We also have experience with uh, about 700 uh, SAS players who, uh, SAS patients who've undergone PPS treatment. And uh, so we know by looking at outcomes uh, in the SAS program, as well as of course our clinical studies, that the responses are very consistent across uh, these hundreds of, of patients showing uh, the same levels of, of pain reduction as well as um, uh, responses in the overall patient experience being very positive. And we believe that's directly related to the multimodal mechanism of action that PPS has. Um, we've shared previously uh, um, the um, uh, effects of PPS on uh, inflammation, on uh, directly on pain, also on tissue preservation, and some uh, uh, improvement in circulation um, through antithrombotic effects of the drug. And these taken together um, provide this multimodal approach uh, to osteoarthritis, which is a disease that affects uh, the the joint fluid, the cartilage around uh, the joint and the bone adjacent. Um, now, when you ask about what is competing in the space, well, currently uh, what's in the space uh, uh, is um, short-term pain management that often is not very well tolerated. So non-steroidals have their limitations and risk. Uh, paracetamol as well uh, is not recommended for long-term treatment. Uh, intraarticular therapy uh, has a limit to how much uh, it can be used, and there are questions about whether or not it uh, causes some longer-term damage to the joint. And of course, we mentioned earlier that uh, opioids, uh, although used, are uh, really uh, not only not recommended by uh, the specialist in osteoarthritis because of their um, uh, uh, abuse, uh, the, the uh, critical problems with uh, opioid addiction, uh, but also they're not that good at relieving pain. So there are a whole lot of risk without much benefit. And so we know clearly there's an unmet need in the space. Uh, we know there have been uh, several fairly recent uh, approaches taken to osteoarthritis that uh, address specific targets. And uh, although they appeared promising, especially at the preclinical phase, but didn't translate uh, to uh, clinical improvement in, fact, in, in that they didn't uh, improve pain and function. And that's somewhat predictable because we know that this is a uh, multifactorial disease and therefore targeting one little aspect of this uh, disease, which really affects um, multiple areas around the joint and the bone uh, is not expected to really translate over from uh, the animals to, to humans. So we feel very confident that um, the multimodal uh, action of PPS, along with the experience we have to date, uh, really gives us great promise to bring this drug to market, uh, not only just for pain and function, but potentially also uh, for disease modifying potential. Thank you, Donna. I think you might be on mute, Sam. I am, sorry. Uh, thank you, Donna, for that. And that uh, concludes all the questions that uh, have been sent through. So thank you, Paul, Marco, Donna. It's certainly been fantastic having Marco and Donna in Australia. Um, and I'm sure Marco is looking forward to meeting several of the, of the investors that are on the call today at the upcoming AGM in November. Um, so Paul, I might just hand over for you for some closing comments and and we'll end the webinar. So thank you to all that joined. Yeah, uh, thank you, Simon. And um, I really just want to um, talk to the investors. And uh, I would have to say from the presentation, like, wow, what a what a, an extremely 
uh, experienced, uh, professional, competent uh, senior management team there is at Paradigm. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Skerritt and Simon White and also Marco for uh, attending the and presenting at the, um, the webinar today. But I'd also like to do a very big thank you to all of the um, Paradigm staff who are behind the scenes and working extremely diligently to make sure that our clinical trial programs progress. And just as one example, let me just um, thank our uh, project management and logistics team. Uh, I think most people would realise that under the situation with COVID, um, the supply chains have been incredibly uh, problematic. But um, Paradigm has continued to find ways to get the drug from warehouses in Europe to sites in, in the UK, uh, in, into the United States, into Canada, into Australia. And um, that is no mean feat. And they have done an extremely uh, amazing job at making sure that we have not had uh, supply chain issues, holdups from our um, uh, warehouse of uh, PPS in Europe. So th this is, um, you know, it's a, it's a large team. It's a very professional team. And I hope as investors, you can see that you have some of the very world's best people working uh, and, and managing your investment. And I would like to thank everyone at Paradigm for, you know, their amazing work and, and also their, um, you know, tremendous diligence. And everyone, I must say, is, is extremely committed to making sure that we can one day bring pentazan polysulfate sodium as a treatment for osteoarthritis to the global stage. And we hope that that's um, not too far from now, but everyone is working very hard to make that happen. Um, I, I would also like to thank um, all of the uh, shareholders who've not only participated today, but some of those who are unable to participate today for their ongoing and very long-term support of Paradigm. We understand it's challenging times. There are obviously major macroeconomic uh, headwinds, and uh, we have seen a decline in their share price. We are more than aware of, of uh, our need to return shareholder value. We are working very hard on, on the program, and we think that the way forward is to make sure that we can continue doing what we're doing, which is generating high quality clinical data. And the tide will turn, and we'll be uh, front and center uh, with a, a product that is moving through a phase three clinical trial and we'll continue to um, work diligently to try and monetize some of those other assets that we uh, have spoken about today. Um, I must say that I'm extremely excited about um, Marco joining the company. Um, Marco brings um, a, a wealth of experience and I'm sure all investors will feel very energized that we have Marco at the helm of managing the business and moving us forward through the next um, <clears throat> development uh, phases for the company. And of course, um, I'm extremely delighted that we have Donna Skerritt, who continues to run the clinical team and provides um, outstanding support for the company and making sure that we continue to develop our clinical data at the highest possible quality so that when it's reviewed by regulators or when it's reviewed by big pharma companies, there, there'll be no stone un, uh, unturned in terms of extracting all of the, the uh, value out of those clinical studies. So I, I would uh, like to just finish and um, say to all the shareholders, uh, thank you for your support. We, we greatly appreciate it. We do recognize you at every board meeting. We talk about uh, shareholder value and, and we are very, very uh, aware of the situation with the um, share price as it's declined over the, the recent uh, period of time. But we are all working extremely hard to make sure that we can do our best so that when the um, situations change, we can really start to separate from the rest of the pack as a company that is um, delivering world-class clinical programs and moving forward at a, at a rate at which no other pharmaceutical company um, is able to comprehend. And, and Beno Pharma constantly talk about how does Paradigm get from this point to this point so quickly? And I think it's the quality of the, the team that's behind the programs. So thank you, everyone. Uh, as always, if you have any particular questions, you can reach out through Simon, or uh, many of you could um, reach out to Dr. Skerritt or, or myself. And if you need to reach out to Marco, we can provide you with Marco's contact details. 
So thank you all. And um, uh, we are working extremely hard and hope that you um, appreciate that um, we're doing our very best. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. And also thanks again to Donna, Marco and Simon for the comprehensive update today. That concludes the Paradigm Biopharmaceuticals Invest webinar. Thanks to all the people who joined for the session and we look forward to seeing you for the next update. Bye for now. Okay. Thanks, Matt.